Hello, hello. Hoy es 17 de enero, San Antón. Patrón y protector de los animales. Pero en este caluroso día de enero de 2036, celebramos algo más que al protector de los gatitos o los perros. Hoy se cumplen 15 años de la prohibición en Europa de la actividad ganadera de vacuno. Un triunfo para los defensores de los animales y del planeta que habitamos. Forget all about oil wells, gas pipes, or coal mines. In the 21st century, the Earth's public enemy number one is cows. What we're seeing now in this early time of the century is that cows in particular are portrayed as animals that are destructive for the planet. They, they, they emit greenhouse gases, they use all those uh, foods that are in competition with our diet, they use lots of land, uh, they need lots of water. We have created, created a, a immense divide between animal foods and plant foods. This is a very polarized world in every sense. Extremists are ready to influence us socially, politically and regulatorily, and they're good at doing their job. In the end, extremists and pioneers ask for certain things. They're often seen as quite distant, but their message cuts across. And they're necessary, as we all need someone that stirs us into action to change the way we think or the way we live. It's a spontaneous reaction and it's, it's reaching the higher policy levels. An example is the Eat Lancet diet that has been proposed by, by various scientists as the best diet for the, for the planet, both for our human health and for planetary health. These are certain global cities that have engaged themselves to reach the Eat Lancet dietary guidelines, and they consist of eating almost no meat, basically. It's a semi-vegetarian diet. So th they have engaged themselves to reach that diet by 2030. Um, and we're talking about big cities, Los Angeles, Barcelona, Paris. Uh, so there, so, and that hasn't passed any democratic check. That's passing above our heads. And to get there, they have stipulated possible routes and, and they include meat taxes, they include nudging, they include not offering meat dishes in schools, canteens. Um, many city councils start to offer standard vegetarian menus. So the landscape is shifting very quickly. They're using arguments like animal welfare and sustainability. They say we're destroying our planet. They're using health as an excuse. But what's at stake here is purely economic interests, replacing animal food by ultra-processed vegan food. We should be clear about this. The model is changing. We're heading for a model controlled by a few powerful investment groups that are already funding this type of enterprise, this type of activities. No one gets rich by chance. The rich are rich because they've made money and they want to make even more money. If we were to annihilate the meat industry in Spain, of course we'd reduce emissions. You remove the cows and the emissions go down, just as it would happen with any other animal or any other human activity. By how much? Well, about 4 or 5% in the short term, maybe even more. 
This is what we'd see now. But then there are things we wouldn't see, things we aren't so certain about. Now, if you're going to implement that worldwide, it will be followed by disaster. What will be the consequences of doing away with cow farming? First of all, we do away with one of the Earth's main sources of methane emissions. It doesn't look like a bad way of stopping global warming, considering that by stopping to eat meat, you'll cut down on emissions more effectively than if you leave your car in the garage. Well, it's clear that the effects of the methane produced by animals and the impact of fossil fuels are quite different. Methane, as produced by animals, stays for about 10 years in the atmosphere, producing global warming. After 10 years, it degrades and becomes part of carbon dioxide, which is then sequestered by plants and eventually eaten by animals. So the circle is short. It's a short-term circle. On the contrary, with fossil fuels, we're extracting carbon, which was formed in the Earth's crust for millions of years and releasing it into the atmosphere. We're sending it into the atmosphere all the time. So, we're always extracting materials that have been inside the Earth for ages, and that will take thousands of years to go back to the hole they came out from. And this is being compared to emissions from animal farming, which are recycled in a short span of time. So, even if methane has a high impact on climate change, if we stopped methane emissions now, we'd be able to see how the Earth cools down in 10 years' time, whereas if we stopped carbon dioxide emissions, the Earth would probably continue to heat up for millions of years. But if we throw out livestock, we're throwing away a very old system of coevolution. It's a coevolution between grass, animals, and humans. So take out the cows. What's going to happen with the grasslands? What's going to happen with all those ecosystems? Um, what is going to happen with soil in general? It's a fanatic idea. It's, it's not something realistic and it would head for, dis for, for destructive effects. Let me give you a very clear example. Take Spanish deesas. A deesa is an ecosystem created by human intervention. It didn't exist as such at the beginning of time. Our deesas are the result of animal farming. A deesa can sequester high amounts of carbon from the atmosphere. If we take out the animals, we'll lose that ability. Often, the approach we take on emissions obliterates the positive effects. These deesas, these mountains, aren't usually shown in the documentaries about cows and climate change, always shot across the Atlantic. What would life be like in Spanish villages without animal farming? Well, 
¿Para qué? Mi padre necesita el dinero. Ya, pero... ¿Crees tú que vale la pena? ¿Pero qué me va a dar por esto? Mira. Ya está me quedo de beca. ¡Qué alegría! Mm. Mira, no te había reconocido, pero qué guapa estás. Han pasado muchos años. Rebeca. Hola. ¿Qué tal? Bien. ¿Todo bien? Bien. Bueno, no ha podido venir. Ay. Bueno. ¿Qué? ¿Habéis llegado a una decisión? Yo estoy súper indecisa. Es que todavía no, no sé lo que tengo que hacer. Nos van a dar una mierda por esto. No, no, no os dais cuenta. Una mierda. Es que tampoco nos pueden dar más. Esto no es lo que era. Nadie nos va a pagar más. Olvidaros. Nadie. Vaya mierda. ¿Sabéis lo que han dado estas tierras por nosotros? ¿Lo sabéis? ¿Qué han dado? ¿Qué te han dado estas tierras? ¿Cuándo has tenido tú 15 días de vacaciones? ¿O cuándo te has sido tú un puente de fin de, fin de semana o, o, o la Semana Santa? Todos los días con el ganado. El ganado come todos los días. El ganado no sabe de Navidad. ¿Sabes, ¿sabes a cuántos partos de, de mis hijos he ido? A ninguno. A ninguno. Y he estado en todos los partos de ellas. Para que luego te venga un imberbe de la ciudad. Recién salido de la universidad. <risa> Que no chafa una mierda en su vida y te diga que eres un maltratador de animales. Cuando esto, tú antes acabas esto. We've been ranting about rural depopulation for decades. Are we now ready to deal with the population effects of the end of cow husbandry? If 115,000 households who make their living out of livestock breeding see their source of income vanish, this will probably accelerate rural flight. We're to expect that a regression in the population in the regions that are most heavily dependent on the meat industry. In fact, three quarters of all livestock farms in Spain can be found in five autonomous communities. Galicia, Castile León, Asturias, Cantabria and Extremadura. And within these communities, beef cattle can be found in mid to high mountain areas, rural hinterland areas which are already badly affected by rural depopulation. In Galicia, for instance, this would mean annihilating agricultural economic activity in two-thirds of the region. It's quite different walking the streets and having known the people who used to live there or the nooks and crannies and how they were used by them. It all depends on who you're with when you visit a place. The same goes for history, everyday life. Tradition. At the end of the day, we're like plants, like trees. We need our branches to grow up, but we also need roots to remain in place. So, we should have both things. We need memory of the past to know what to do with the present and the future. All those activities that have shaped an era, for as long as they've been kept alive, they're like the embers that keep the fire burning. When they're lost, as we've said before, they belong to archaeology.
Este museo es una oportunidad para todos los niños que no han tenido el privilegio de conocer lo que era la ganadería de vacuno. Les cuesta mucho imaginar cómo las vacas que ahora viven en las reservas antes campaban libremente por nuestros campos. Pueden experimentar con olores desconocidos, sonidos, conocer especies desaparecidas, incluso profesiones ancestrales. Conocer nuestro pasado reciente es la clave para comprender a lo que hemos llegado hoy en día. Yo creo que es muy importante darse cuenta I believe we must realize how dependent we are on our rural areas. Our food, the management of soil that results in clean air and fresh water. This type of land management is what feeds us, what quenches our thirst, what helps us breathe. And also it's associated with diversity at all levels, diversity of species and diversity of ecosystems. When a species or an adapted breed is lost, we don't really know what's being lost along with it. It's a tragedy for our planet and for our species. In the 1950s, we left rural areas and moved to coastal towns. The areas we fled were left for the woods to encroach on them. If we end cow grazing, an activity that's regulated, sustainable, etc., the vegetation will change from herbaceous grasslands to shrubs, that is, shrublands, woody vegetation, and eventually woods. This evolution could seem positive at first sight. The downside is it has several disadvantages. For instance, wildfires. La gestión forestal Forest management, silvicultural treatment, is about three to four thousand euro per hectare. In a healthy economy, maybe it isn't too difficult to spend four million euro in the management of soil and forest areas. But is this sustainable? Will the changing political parties and public administrations be able to keep up the investment effort? Forests never stop growing, so investment may become unsustainable over time. In the past few years, farming censuses have shown a decrease in extensive farming in Spain, and this poses a big problem, as the head of livestock we have in extensive farming today is not enough to keep the grasslands we need. And I don't mean in terms of benefits, but in terms of necessary habitats. The benefits of cow grazing in the mountains or the fields seem clear. But cows also spend part of their lives being fed on farms. What are the costs of cow feeding for the planet? Are the soybeans that are so bad for the Amazon rainforest used to feed the cows? When we analyze what we see in a cow's daily plate of food, broadly speaking, we could say that about 80% are things we could never eat. They aren't in competition with human food. They include straw, fodder, grass, byproducts, that is, things whose use as food has no direct connection to humans or even to pigs, poultry, or other animal species. In a scenario in which we take out cows, especially beef cattle, by 2035, we'd see the Amazon as it looks today. 
or if things go on like this, even worse. It isn't really cows that are feeding on soybeans. We couldn't foresee the thunderstorms created by wildfires. We couldn't foresee the permanent climate change following a wildfire in the course of a year. We couldn't predict the social emergencies triggered by smothering air 1,000 kilometers away from a fire. And now, we're witnessing wildfires we couldn't have foreseen 10 years ago. So the question about the end of extensive farming and the world in 15 years' time is a question we should have asked 15 years ago. What would happen to the woods? We can see this now. There are abandoned areas with an amount of fuel to start fires beyond our power to extinguish them. We need to understand that we have an undivided surface that has to be split up to deal with forest fires, and that this can only be done through civic cultural management and extensive farming for plotted land. The Earth will continue to exist at its own pace. Our planet and nature will go on with or without us. The question is what we're going to do to live comfortably with this planet, rather than what will happen to the planet itself. Yo es que no puedo perder más tiempo. Esto lo entendemos, ¿verdad? ¿Entiendes lo que es el sacrificio? Te vas a olvidar de tu familia, de tu vida, de tu tiempo. Y vas a tener que trabajar de verdad. ¿Tú quieres formar parte del cuerpo? Seguro. ¿Tú sabes lo que nos vamos a encontrar? ¿Lo que os vais a encontrar vosotros? ¿Los nuevos? ¿Sabes lo que es? Porque yo no tengo ni idea. Pues, pues arrea, chaval, arrea. Y esta ha sido nuestra previsión de incendios para hoy. Pero antes de terminar, os dejamos con la receta de la semana. El tradicional cocido madrileño de garbanzos, tofu y seitan. There are two sides to sustainable food trends. On the one hand, they're good, raising awareness of methods of production that are associated with pollution and wrongdoing. On the other hand, they can be wrong, promoting processes that involve vegan foods instead of cattle farming, that are equally industrial and lead to the destruction of forests and other natural ecosystems ecosistemas naturales. Having worked on sustainability indicators for the food industry, we've developed a set of 15 indicators. They refer to energy consumption, for instance, or the use of raw materials, what types of raw materials are being used, where they come from and so on, or the use of water. Water is, without a doubt, our most precious natural resource. 
So, if I wanted people to stop eating meat, an effective argument could be to blame them for exhausting our fresh water supplies. Of course, one of the big issues in connection with cattle breeding is the amount of water used to produce the meat we eat. For each kilo of meat produced, hundreds of litres of water are used. But when I say that a cow needs a lot of water to produce one kilo of meat, I'm not thinking about the water the cow drinks, which is in fact a residual amount. We have to take into account the sources of the water used, the three types of water considered to calculate the water footprint, green water, blue water and grey water. Green water refers to the amount of water from precipitation. Blue water is the volume of water sourced from reservoirs, wetlands, lakes, etc. If we use too much of this water, it could be dangerous, for it could lead to the exhaustion of fresh water resources. Finally, grey water refers to the volume of water required to dilute the pollutants from an activity. In cow farming, probably almost 90% of the water used to produce one kilo of meat is green water, which means it'll be around anyway. It's rainwater. It has no significant impact on the ecosystem. Rural flight. Biodiversity. Wildfires. Climate change. Are cows really the enemies of our planet? Have processed vegan foods come to the rescue? So I became a vegan when I was 16 years old. And I did it because I met another teenage girl who was a vegan. Her whole family were vegans and they were really into it. Part of the problem when you are a vegan is that it really becomes your sense of identity. It's like your sense of self. Um, this was supposed to be the best thing for, for you, for your health, for the animals, for the environment, for the planet, for starving people. Like every, they had everything covered. So there was no way that it wasn't gonna work. It had to work. All of that had to be true. So when I started to get bad you know, sort of bad um, health outcomes from it, there wasn't any way for me to really think about it. So I lived with that cognitive dissonance for, for two decades. Well, my health collapsed completely at the end of 20 years. I was so exhausted I could barely stand up. So on the day that you give up being a vegan, it's very traumatizing. You have no idea what your place is in the world. Why did I become a vegan? What did I think I was doing? Why did I think this would help all of these problems? And at the end of the day, I came to the conclusion that while my ethical framework was completely right, and I still hold those values, so justice and sustainability and compassion and anything that questions human hubris, like those are the only values that are going to get us to the world that we need. The way that I was putting those values into practice, I was completely wrong. I wasn't saving animals. In fact, I was really hurting animals. It was a fairy tale because I, I didn't know where my food came from and I didn't know the cost that the world was paying for it. A shift to, a, to such a plant-based diet is, is certainly not what's going to benefit the farmers. Uh, farmers are under lots of pressure and their life is becoming increasingly difficult. To that extent that some people even want to push them out and change the, the food system. And in a way it's, it's pretty much a logical conclusion of how those companies work since their very beginning. You have to see that those companies started to become big in the 1950s, post-war, post-Second World War, those companies found a market opportunity uh, to make convenient foods. There's something new and exciting in the Betty Crocker kitchens. And here's Betty Crocker herself. And this is what we're so excited about, my new marble cake mix. It's entirely new. The only marble cake mix in one package that you can mix in one bowl. And the one bowl method makes it so very easy. You just add water and two fresh eggs. 
So they have created convenience, they grew, they have saturated at some point their national markets, they became multinationals, they have saturated the global market, and then they had to innovate because the system is built on growth. You have to present growth to your shareholders, otherwise you're out. So you have to grow all the time. There's been a turning point in investment groups' access to the food industry. Since the commodity crisis of 2007-2008, they've set a new target for themselves, focusing on food as a safe value, a value that doesn't fluctuate because of a growing population that will always need to eat. They saw that there was money in commodities, especially in agricultural commodities, which could be used to make cheap food, to present society with cheap foods. That's where they add the value. So they take the primary materials, they add value by processing, and they sell at a higher price. And health was the sales argument. I think the main beneficiaries are the major corporations that, the agricultural corporations. So right now there are six companies that essentially control the world food supply. That's really a monopoly when you're talking about just six. The point is not choosing between meat and peas, meat and chickpeas, which is the trivial discussion we're being offered. The point is meat fresh meat versus ultra-processed vegan foods, which contain 15 or 20 different ingredients. I think there's 17 patents that went into making that stuff. You have to be out of your mind to eat food that requires a patent. I mean, these are substances that have never existed before in the world. Why would you want to eat them? I, it seems insane to me. And then they produce a speech based on sustainability, based on how bad making and eating meat are at all levels. Bad for your health, bad for sustainability, bad for the environment, and so on. They produce this speech. What for? To make more money. ¿Qué? ¿Cómo ha ido, hijo? Duro, como siempre. ¿Y las pruebas de ingreso cuándo son? Yo qué sé, quedarán dos semanas, por eso meten tanta caña. ¿Y tú estás convencido que eso es lo que quieres hacer? Mira, aquí en la planta cada día tenemos más trabajo. Ya sabes cómo está el tema y esto irá a más. Yo podría encontrarte algo. No empieces, papá. Déjalo. Vale, vale, hijo. Venga, nos vemos en casa para la cena. No, no puedo. Curro en el burger. Mañana nos vemos, ¿vale? Ok, bueno, hasta mañana. Venga, un beso. Sigue, Víctor, sigue. There's this illusion that we can just replace animal foods, such as beef, with their plant imitations. And that's just an easy process. It is not an easy process. Um, it's a very reductionist idea. Um, if you look at the list of ingredients of those imitation products, they are um, mostly uh, very long lists with lots of additives and texturizers and so on. But more importantly, if you look at the very basis of those products, 
Even though they call them plant-based, you will not find plants in those products. What you will find is ex extracts. There's nothing that remotely looks like a vegetable in, the, in most of those imitation things. Making ultra-processed foods like most vegan substitutes of hamburgers and the other alternative foods we can find at the supermarket requires a lot of energy. And not just energy. This industry uses a lot of plastic and it has big implications. Clearly, it's far from being a zero alternative, a zero impact or zero waste industry as compared to livestock production. So it is, it, I would say it's a business model that is offering a lot of potential for those companies and that's why they're all on top of it. Plus the fact that it helps to, to, to health wash and to green wash their, their products. To give you an idea of what's at stake here, four of the ten richest companies in the world, to the best of our knowledge, are investing in ultra-processed vegan foods or lab-grown meat. They are big corporations, huge investment groups, not NGOs. They're companies, corporations, investment funds, and they clearly want to make money. Why are we making fake bacon? And these things are really popular. There's all kinds of fake meatballs and fake hamburgers and fake sausages. And then there's like weird vegan cheese. And I think the reason honestly is because we have an instinctive ancestral hunger for meat and they are denying themselves what their bodies know their bodies need, but they're not letting themselves eat it. There are too many nutrients that we need that can only be found in animal products. I mean, you can limp along trying that, like if you wanna be a vegan, there's so many things you have to take though. So you would need an omega-3 supplement. You would need vitamin D. You would need vitamin A. You would need B12. You would need heme iron. I don't know, they just, it's sad because you're, you're never gonna feel as good as when you eat an actual burger or, you know, you drink an actual glass of raw grass-fed milk or, you know, eat a piece of cheese or butter, my God, there's nothing like it. La siguiente paciente es la señora Raquel. Tienes un mensaje nuevo de tu hija. Papá, ¿me recoges a la misma hora de siempre? Eh, no, no reserves para cenar, ¿vale? Que hoy escojo yo. Eh, ¿Deriva a la señora Raquel a la clínica Gullo? Derivada. La vitamina B y el hierro te lo tomas por la mañana nada más levantarte, que se absorbe mejor. Y después por la tarde ya te vas tomando el suplemento de calcio y de... ¿Qué pasa? Ya hemos llegado. ¿Cómo? Vamos. Teníamos hora. Pasar.
I hope we've realized the environmental and sustainability issues we have to deal with. And then the COVID-19 pandemic forced us to think things over and take a different look at them, a look we wouldn't have taken otherwise. The number one thing that we could do to stop global warming is to let the grasses and the appropriate ruminants get to work. Because the one thing they do really well is build soil. So we don't need Elon Musk. We don't need any crazy technology. We don't need some giant vacuum cleaner that's going to suck the carbon out of the sky and store it underground in some crazy way. We just need grasses and ruminants. So that's that's all I've got. The, the, it's like the grasses and the ruminants. Um, without them, there is there's that's it. That's all we've got. That's our hope is let the world come back to life, and and it will. <laughs>